Hello, in this video I'm going to talk about Bezier do's and don'ts. Um, so basically best practices for drawing Bezier curves. Um, if, you've gone, if you go through all of the videos in this series, you'll notice that I talk a lot about uh, how, to de how to design letters um, primarily for lowercase. Uh, you'll also see that I talk about um, I also talk about, you know, best practices for getting nice curves um, and other aspects for, you know, these things, working with Bezier curves. But what I didn't really talk about was best practices for drawing Beziers in a way that they are prepared appropriately um, for PostScript output. Now, when I say PostScript output, that really refers to, it does refer to a print output, so it could be a desktop printer, it could be... Um, it could be offset print, printing, or it could be uh, outputting uh, postscripts for laser cutters. And these kind of machines, they read postscript language. So the postscript language is actually really what we're speaking to when we encode Bezier curves for typeface design. And this does correspond as well to what happens when our fonts are used in digital atmospheres only, like if we're designing a font that we want to be used on the web or in some kind of digital interface, virtual reality interface, um, we care about postscript curves uh, and, the, and the way that they should be prepared because when postscript curves are rasterized for the screen and they might have hinting applied to them uh, or these other processes to make the outlines work well in the screen environment, if the postscript math is not properly prepared, there can be errors that arise even in these contexts in the font file itself. Um, these issues will probably be seen a lot less in a digital environment, but I think we shouldn't discount that. We should be preparing good file structures. Um, in, in font design, when it comes to drawing the letter forms, we care about how are we preparing the Bezier curves because that's what we're preparing when we're working on a typeface design in a digital context. So, when I say Bezier do's and don'ts, there are some things that we should be aware of. So I'm going to make another layer here, and I'm going to draw on this layer here of N. Now, I've been preparing the Bezier curves properly, and you'll remember if you go back to the, uh, if you're in one of the introductory videos in this series, you'll remember that I talked about this kind of rule where you can't have handlebars from different points intersecting one another. So you can't have something like this where if this is zero, and you have to imagine, actually, let me draw something here. You have to imagine. Uh, a, a grid when you're drawing vector curves. Even in Adobe Illustrator, of you know, the most arguably arguably the most popular program for drawing vectors, um, albeit not the best program for drawing vector curves at all, uh, even that program has to work off of the same logic of the postscript mathematics. And postscript mathematics are based on the uh, the mathematics developed by Pierre Bezier. Uh, for drawing Bezier curves, which is a system of plotting curves mathematically. And PostScript has works off of some slightly different algorithms as well, but it's this is lying at its core also, especially when we're thinking about drawing these curves. So you have to imagine that a curve like this on the inside of the N, this curve right here, the way that PostScript um, is read by the computer and by an output device that is rendering these Bezier curves is that these two points are like this is a segment essentially this right here is a segment however the way that this curve is being described is that the handlebar from this point to the handlebar is 77 units on the grid and by comparison We've remember we set this up in a way if you look at the earlier videos that I had these values being the same and I talked about why within PostScript math that actually produces really beautiful curves. This is part of the reason. Um, it doesn't have to be the exact same mathematical value but you have to think about the fact that 
the way that you, the computer is actually reading this math is that everything's plotted inside square quadrants. That's why it's so important that our curves, when we have extrema points, are either at zero degrees on the grid or at 90 degrees. Otherwise, we start seeing really weird stuff and really not ideal curves, things that don't look very good. Now, that's fine, and it works really well in this context. So what you never want to do, here's a don't, you never want to see a situation like this because look what happens to the curve. You also never want to see a situation like that's not very common. But what could be common is something like this. Let's say that you're trying to draw a tight curve. And what you end up doing is you, maybe this happens by accident, and you're drawing the curve, and it's just, a, you know, like negative 2 into this area. It's crossed the zero point. It's doing something still weird. There's a slight weird cramping aspect to this area of the curve here. And I'm getting this kind of, you know, uh, maybe the shoulder curve that I want to get here, but this could potentially produce problems in the postscript output because the computer or the postscript math expects that anywhere there is a curve there has to be an anchor point that's what it expects so that's why there's an anchor here at the extreme part of the curve this also helps us explain what the extrema point is imagine that this outer contour right here is in a box I'm gonna make it look more like it's in a box Postscript expects that wherever the apex of the curve is, or the vertex if it's at the bottom, it expects there's an anchor point at this top area, at this part of the curve, because it has to anchor the curve. So that's why we have to have extrema points. It's critical. Because if I output a typeface that's like this, Postscript's either going to try to guess in the, in, when the file is compiled, but most likely that's not going to happen. When the postscript's happening, there can be really crazy things that happen like this, or much worse. I've seen, I've seen instances where typefaces, for some reason, the postscript data either wasn't correct or it uh, didn't work properly during my time at Coach House Press. And sometimes, for instance, like the counter of the A or the G was just gone, the lowercase g. Uh, the counters were just gone. It was so it was like a dark mass of character because there was some kind of postscript error. And that's not always the font designer's uh, fault. That could be that the file got corrupted, and it happened to be some of the postscript data. Um, some of the postscript data was corrupted in the process. Sometimes it could be poorly prepared Bezier outlines. That's totally something that happens. But so we always want to avoid stuff like this. I'm going to go back in time, or actually, I don't have to because I've. I'm only working on a layer, but so you want to see something like this where you you're either at zero or you're inside this square quadrant, okay? And that goes for drawing script typefaces. If you need an extra point, add an extra point. If you want to get a curve, but once again, this would be bad. You'd have to make sure that this is inside that area. So I know that this might feel like oh, this is kind of boring. I I like thinking about my curves a little bit more loosely, but when we're in this context of drawing Bezier curves, that actually looks pretty cool. When we're in this context of drawing Bezier curves, we have to be thinking about it this way. That's why we prepare a sketch and then we interpret the sketch with the Bezier curves. Now, um, another thing that we should touch on is what to do with point sequences like this. Now, if I was working on a, if I'm working on a curve like this, and in fact, there's a better letter for this, uh, the lowercase c, there are going to be a lot of situations like this where you're not working off of a um, a curved segment where both of the strokes are going in perfect 90 and 0 degree points on the grid. You might be working in a, in a situation where you've got something like this, where, and I need to make a copy here so I don't lose the top layer where you see something like this, where actually this is going on an angle. Now, technically, this segment right here does not require any anchor point because everything is working just fine. Uh, if I'm to put guidelines in here, and I align this here at the top, and I align this here on the side, technically, this is fine because it's within this, this area. In fact, this is another way to look at it. 
So that's within that area. This is okay. It does not require any more points along this segment. That's great. Obviously, this should have an extrema point. And remember, if you want to add extrema points easily, you know, let glyphs do a little bit of work for you. You can add extremes and then you can fix it around. But I recommend you make a mask first and then you let the extrema point go. This one was pretty self-explanatory to the system, to the postscript math. It knew that uh, we need to put one right there. No problem. But there's this curve segment. You can have problems with these kind of things. And in particular, these scenarios can be the tough ones. And even like I was looking in here, these segments where you've got a curve, but you've got a point here that just has a corner point, a blue corner point, this can be problematic because if you were to do this and overlap the, the BCP, technically this is called a BCP. We call it handlebars, but it's a BCP and this is a point, a node in Bezier and PostScript Math. If I'm overlapping like this, I can actually draw really nice curves like this. It's actually a great way to get a smooth curve. I use this technique a lot, but what you have to do though is this would actually produce an issue in glyphs and the postscript math if these overlap. Because if these are overlapping, the, the BCP is being confused with the node in the system and it's just not going to work. So we actually need to have these revealed. So if you grab the outline, you can reveal it again. So what I do is if I want to use this technique, I'll, I'll apply these points like this with a mask in the background first. And I don't even need a mask actually. I would start drawing the curve like this personally. And I'll get it to look the way that I want it to look. And then what I'll do is I'll make a mask of how this looks and then I'll reveal this again just a little bit, just a tiny bit. And then I'll get the BCPs floating back into the area where they need to be. And there you go. It's perfect. So that's a good technique. And I think actually if we looked at uh, the top layer. Oh, wait. Why did that do that? Um, well, if I'm looking at the top layer anyways, if I flip to the top layer. Ah, that's because I'm in it. Why is that happening? Okay. If you look, I actually think that the curve is better on the bottom. It's stronger and smoother. So that's one way to do it. But you, what you just don't do is you don't leave those points overlapped. That's an okay scenario right here. This is fine. Okay. But you don't want them to be overlapped. Now, something else that you might see... I'm going to have to fake this for now, but it's something that you might see happen is if, I don't know if I'm going to be able to actually fake this. Okay, how do I show this? What is basically I'm trying to show is the way that these segments might overlap. Okay. Um, I think this is not going to be easy to show. Essentially what you might see sometimes, and yeah, it's a little bit difficult to show, but let me see if I can fake it somehow. No, the Beziers are drawn too well, I suppose. What happens if I pen tool or something really rough? I mean, it's, a bad, it's not a bad problem to have that we're not getting this, but essentially what we would be seeing is I've got two overlapping shapes, okay, on a letter like the A, and many other characters have this too. And what I could potentially see, which is a postscript error that uh, just arises from the paths not being in the same direction, is this little area here that's overlapping with the stem will actually be knocked out in white, this little area. So you would see a weird kind of thing where this was a little chunk of white and then this was black still and this would be black like the negative. This would be positive. So it's going to obviously be unideal. That's not good. And you might even see it not in here, but you might see it when you export the font file. So the way to solve that without having to compound the shape by merging it together like this is to go to paths and correct path direction. 
so what ends up happening is with Bezier curves, every path has to have, they have to be going in the same direction. If this is going, well, actually, this will probably do it if I change the direction. No. Ah, there we go. That's it. There you go. That's the error that you would see coming up. And this can happen because you just might have drawn one of the compound strokes, one of the compound shape groups, and they might have had a different direction. So you see what's happening here? When you see a triangle on any contour, there's only one, because there's only one start point. An illustrator has a start point as well. In order for these strokes, these paths, to all be um, overlapping properly as a knockout like this, as opposed to this, is these paths have to be going in the same direction. And you can tell if your paths are going in the same direction if you look at the start points. And the way to fix this, of course, is to say correct path direction. And what it does is it puts the paths in the same direction. Now, when you're working on a variable font or any typeface that's across masters, Remember, we, if you look in the, uh, the video where we talk about compatibility and maintaining that, if I have start points in different directions, and now the way to locate the start point is to go click on a point, control click or right click, and say make node first. That means make it the start point. But technically, this will not export as a variable font right now. And Glyphs just hasn't caught up yet and found the error. But technically, right now, these two outlines, and if I actually type two A's here, I didn't have to do that, but if I type two A's, I don't see a bold A right now. Let's, let's ignore that factor. But let's just look at these two outlines. The start point on this contour for the bowl is at the base point. And now, it doesn't matter where that start point technically is. There's not an ideal, there is no ideal place for it to necessarily be. But when you're working across masters, these start points have to be going in the same direction and they have to be in the same spot. So for instance, this start point actually has to be here. So I would right click on or, or control click and make the node first. Now this is a compatible master range for the glyph A. Okay, that's everything that you need to know for Bezier do's and don'ts. And please, if you have any questions about the, uh, if you're having any errors or issues come up, just feel free to ask me in class, um, or you can ask me during open office hours, and we'll definitely address any issues. Because sometimes weird problems come up when you're working on a typeface, and it just takes a little bit more digging than these simple uh, solutions. Okay.